frankly, I'm confused about what the, uh, what the electorate have been saying. Um, before that, though, but very much in conjunction with what Barry is going to talk about tonight, I would just like to draw your attention to the program from next, the next first Wednesday on December the 1st, potential US responses to Iran's nuclear ambitions, which I think is remarkably uh, relevant and actual. Um, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's speaker, Barry Dunsmore, who has covered foreign affairs for ABC News for 30 years, reporting from Washington and abroad on the policies of seven US presidents, from Johnson to Clinton. He traveled overseas with them and was a regular on the planes of their secretaries of state. From 1965 to 1995, he reported from more than 100 countries on virtually every major international event, from wars to summits to diplomatic shuttles. So please join me in welcoming Barry Dunsmore. I apologize. I just stepped on the, I stepped on the cable that's uh, holding me. Never did like cable TV, did you? <clears throat> yeah. That's true. <laughs> Why don't I just put it on the table? Okay, that's fine. That'll look fine. Uh, I, I also uh, recently have become, uh, let's put it this way, I find it difficult to see with one eye. So, anyway, thank you very much for coming. Uh, delighted to see almost a full house here. I, I was thinking the other day, uh, before the uh, San Francisco Giants won the World Series, I think, God, it's going to be a baseball game that night, and I wonder if I wonder if anybody will show up. I, I wonder if I'll show up. You know, I'm a big baseball fan. Anyway, um, the Giants obliged, and so here we all are. Uh, I, I had a similar obligation uh, two years, or exactly two years ago, uh, for the Vermont Humanities, in which I summarized the results of the 2008 election. Uh, that was at the Burlington Library uh, under. Uh, Somewhat different circumstances, I guess one could say. Um, the, one of the things about this assignment is it, it, it kind of gets me back to my old journalistic days, which I have been away from for, uh, for quite some time. But um, I've had a relatively short period of time to throw this all together, so please uh, bear with me if I lose my place, which I inevitably will. Uh, and I've got bits and pieces of paper here, there, and yon. In any case, um, I think one can certainly begin by saying that there's absolutely no way to sugarcoat uh, the results of yesterday's election. Uh, the Democrats were soundly defeated, and Obama and his policies were strongly repudiated. And all the gains that the, de the Democrats made in 2006 and 2008 have been wiped out, and then some. Uh, the Republican sweep of the House has been even greater than it was in 1994. And not since 1938, when Democrats lost more than 70 seats, has there been such a major shift. Interestingly, in 1938, the implementation of Social Security was uh, one of the major issues. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that the uh, Republicans have picked up at least 60 seats uh, to have a very comfortable majority in the House. Uh, at last count, they had uh, picked up six Senate seats, and there are still three Senate seats, as far as I know, that are yet to be decided in Colorado, in Washington State, and in, uh, in uh, Alaska. Uh, but uh, those will not change the, uh, the overall balance. Uh, the Democrats will hold a very slender lead in the Senate, and therefore they will be able to uh, to do uh, almost as little as they did before when they had many more seats in the Senate. Uh, but in this particular case, maybe they'll have an opportunity themselves to use the filibuster, which the Republicans have so successfully done for uh, recent years. Um, I, I thought it might be helpful just for all of us, uh, because I'm assuming that most of you uh, were busy during the day and may well not have seen the president or not even seen the news. So I have with me uh, some short, uh, uh, news reports on, uh, on the day's activities. The first one comes from the Washington Post. The headline was, Obama reflects on shellacking in his midterm elections. 
President Obama appearing somber and reflective after what he described as a shellacking at the polls on Tuesday night, conceded Wednesday that his connection with Americans had grown rockier over the last two years, and he expressed a sadness over the defeats of congressional Democrats who had supported him. In a news conference a day after the midterm elections, and in Republicans' control of the House and gains in the Senate, Obama said he was eager to work with the GOP leaders and listen to good ideas wherever they come from. But he said it would not be easy to reach an agreement on contentious issues. People are frustrated, Obama said in an opening statement. They're deeply frustrated with the pace of the economic recovery and the opportunities they hope for their children and grandchildren. They want jobs to come back faster. He said he told Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell and uh, Representative John Boehner, the new presumptive speaker of the House, that he is very eager to sit down with members of both parties and figure out how we can move forward. I'm not suggesting this will be easy. I don't pretend that we will be able to bridge every difference or solve every disagreement. He said, nevertheless, there is a hope for civility, and he urged elective officials to remember that our first allegiance as citizens is not to party or region uh, or faction, but to country. Because we may be proud Democrats or proud Republicans, we are prouder to be Americans. He cited energy independence and education as two of the potential common ground uh, areas for congressional action. Um, he said, as I reflect on what happened over the past two years, one of the things I think that has not been managed by me as well as it needed to be was finding the right balance in making sure that businesses have the rules of the road and are treating customers fairly, but also making absolutely clear that America only succeeds if businesses are succeeding. Obama reflected that Presidents Reagan and Clinton had experienced similar midterm defeats. You know, this is something I think every president needs to go through, said the president, but the responsibilities of this office are so enormous and so many people are depending on what we do, and in the rush of activity, we sometimes lose track of the ways that we are connected with the folks who got us here in the first place. Now, I'm not recommending that any future president may take the shellacking that I did last night. Uh, on the other side of town in Washington, fresh off, and this comes from the, uh, from the New York Times uh, late this afternoon, fresh off their sweeping victories in the midterm elections, congressional Republican leaders on Wednesday said they would use their new majority in the House and bolstered ranks in the Senate to pursue a vision of smaller government and lower spending, as well as the continuation of the Bush era tax cuts, which are due to expire at the end of the year. At a news conference at the Capitol, the likely House Speaker Representative John Boehner and Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky invited President Obama to work with them on these and other goals, but they also quickly adopted an aggressive posture on some certain to antagonize the Democrats, including a vow to repeal the big new health care law. Mr. Boehner renewed his call for cutting discretionary spending to 2008 levels and for rock solid oversight of the executive branch. And Mr. McConnell even went so far as to threaten that the Democrats would face additional political losses in the future should they refuse to move toward the Republicans on an array of policy issues, including spending, trade, and energy. We are determined to stop the agenda Americans have rejected, Mr. McConnell said. We'll work with the administration when they agree with the people and confront them when they do not. So that's the red hot news of, of what was being said by the, uh, the two sides today. Uh, basically, what uh, I think what it says on the program is that uh, what I was going to try to do tonight is to, to take a look at my view of what the voters were saying and perhaps also an explanation as to why they may have said it. Uh, it can certainly be argued that the uh, voters spoke very loudly, but, and they are clearly unhappy with many things, including the policies and performances of President Barack Obama. But their message is anything but clear, often because it's based on conflicting objectives. Overall, voters did not express any clear preferences that might help direct the lawmakers, they indiscriminately ousted Democratic incumbents who loyally supported Obama's agenda, including the health care law, as well as lawmakers who carved out their own path by voting against the president and the party leadership. 
In surveys outside the polling places, 39% of voters said reducing the budget deficit should be the top priority of the next Congress. While nearly as many said the first order of business should be job creation. Just 18% said the top priority should be cutting taxes. You'll note there that uh, repealing the health care bill is not up on the top or even near the top of that list. Well, part of the reason for the confusion in the voters' minds, and I think uh, there certainly was some, uh, can be laid at the feet of President Obama. He and uh, the White House generally did a poor job in selling their legislative successes. Well, for example, there was a significant tax cut, uh, especially for the middle class in the stimulus package. Most people were and still are not even aware of that. On the other hand, the Republican salesmen were very good at selling things, even when it could be argued that much of what they were selling was uh, not exactly factual. Republicans were successful in defining Obama's first two years as a failure, and somehow having spent the past two years doing everything possible to block Obama's policies, largely through the highly undemocratic rules of the Senate, which allow for a minority of 41 senators to prevent the majority from doing almost anything, Republicans were able to avoid being held in any way accountable for the economic mess from which we are all, fa which we are all facing and which so soured the electorate. The Republican strategy of saying no has actually worked quite well. And I would argue that when people complain that Washington is dysfunctional, the Senate filibuster is one of the principal reasons. Yet the fact of the matter is that the people neither know nor care about filibuster rules and they simply want results. Another part of the Republican strategy was to portray Obama as a wild spending liberal. They were able to define the health care reform as a total government takeover of health care that contains secret plans for things like death panels, implying there would be some form of euthanasia for older people. That was concocted, as uh, many of you I'm sure will recall, by Sarah Palin. And not one Republican leader, not even Charles Grassley, who had spent many months with the Democrats uh, in trying to establish some kind of a bipartisan bill, and so he knew better not even Grassley challenged the Palin myth about the death panels. Republicans also successfully dissed and dismissed the nearly $800 billion stimulus package as a waste and a failure. Now actually, the health care reform bill is a long way from being a government takeover of health care. In fact, it goes out of its way to preserve and to protect the private, for-profit health care industry something, in fact, which liberal opponents of the health care law, of which there are really quite a few, say significantly contribute to it being the most expensive health care system in the world. As for the stimulus package, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has found that it saved or created as many as three million jobs. But with the unemployment rate stuck at nearly 10 percent, that really didn't matter to most voters. In exit polls, only one third of the voters said they thought the stimulus had worked. Two years ago, we were perched on the abyss of a depression that might equal or even exceed the 1930s. The federal government deficit was very, very low, if at all, on the voters' radar screens. Most Americans at that time wanted government to save capitalism and to keep the country from falling into that abyss. But once it seemed likely that the country would escape that fate, a steady drumbeat about deficits was begun. It was picked up by Republican echo chambers in the news media, notably Rush Limbaugh and Fox News, which eventually convinced millions of Americans that the deficit was the root of all evil. This was evident in a snapshot taken on the eve of the election in the New York Times CBS poll, which found that nine out of 10 likely voters said they considered government spending a very important issue. More than half said they favored smaller government offering fewer services. However, and this is a rather large however, there was absolutely no consensus on what programs should be cut. For example, the growing costs of Social Security is one of the government's major challenges long term, but there was strong opposition to increasing the retirement age and for reducing benefits for future recipients. On the other hand, there was absolutely no support for raising taxes 
even to deal with mushrooming costs that will come as the baby boomers retire. On top of that, there is now dwindling support even for raising taxes on those families with a net taxable income of more than a quarter of a million dollars. And I think it's, it's important to sort of stress that point that when they talk about people who's, who have uh, incomes of 250000 or more, that's taxable income. It's not, it's not their net income or it's, it's not their, certainly not their gross income. So uh, we're talking about people who, make, who earn uh, either in their businesses or in salaries a lot more than a quarter of a million dollars. To expend that part of the Bush tax cuts that are scheduled to expire at the end of this year will cost about $700 billion over the next decade. Now, President Obama argued that if you want to give the richest 1% of the country a tax cut of this size, one that they do not need, how serious are you about curbing the deficit? But that argument fell on deaf ears, deaf ears, and frankly, uh, based on what he said today, I would predict that uh, President Obama is ready pretty much to cave on this issue, and all the tax cuts, including those for the rich, are very likely to be extended for at least another two years. Again, so much for the deficit. Also in that final time CBS poll, Republicans were seen as equal to Democrats at job creation, and by a wide margin, Republicans were seen as better able to reduce the federal budget deficit. Now, once again, these voters' opinions, on which they presumably voted, don't entirely conform to reality. In the eight years of the George W. Bush administration, there was less job growth than at any time in several decades. As for controlling the deficits, the Bush administration inherited a budget surplus from Bill Clinton. Then it opted to raise taxes or to look for, uh, and, and, and decided not to look for any way to pay for the cost of two wars, two major tax cuts, the prescription drug benefit, and the bank bailouts of 2008. So far, those policies have added close to $10 trillion to the national debt, and given that the wars of, in Iraq and Afghanistan are still costing billions of dollars every week, the multi-trillion dollar deficit for those programs continues to grow. So, what will happen now? Well, I've read you uh, the uh, pretty hard line the Republican leaders have taken today. In polls during the campaign, some two-thirds of all Republican voters were solidly against any compromise with Obama. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has openly stated, and I, I've assumed that you probably have heard this, that his top priority is to make sure that Obama is a one-term president. Earlier this month, Representative Mike Pence, a senior member of the Republican House leadership, said there will be no compromise on stopping runaway spending, deficits, and debt. There will be no compromise on repealing Obamacare. There will be no compromise on stopping Democrats from growing government and raising taxes. This said Mr. Pence. And if I haven't been clear enough, he added, let me say it again, no compromise. Well, House Majority, uh, uh, so minority, now majority leader, uh, John Boehner picked up the theme of no compromise a few days later and he was uh, uh, saying it loud and clearly again uh, last night and again today. And as we know, it's not official yet, but uh, Boehner will be chosen by the new, as the new speaker by House Republicans when the new Congress convenes in January, replacing Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi, as we know, became the bete noire of Republicans throughout this last Congress. She was targeted along with the president, and oftentimes they were together in the ads, as a free-spending liberal and was part of the most Republican negative campaigning and advertising. It was no surprise then that, that more than 40% of the voters had an unfavorable opinion of Nancy Pelosi. On the other hand, the man who would be speaker remains a virtual unknown to average voters, and fully three quarters have no opinion of him. Now, I wonder if that would have been the case if Democrats had hammered him in millions of dollars of negative ads about his performance on the floor of the House back in 1996. As the House debated a bill to slash tobacco subsidies, Boehner was on the floor passing out envelopes to fellow Republicans containing checks 
from the Political Action Committee of Tobacco Company Brown and Williamson Corporation. He was stopped when two freshman Republicans confronted him and voiced their displeasure. Boehner did not apologize. He conceded that some people might be upset or get the wrong idea, but he says, the floor of the house is the only place where you get to see your colleagues. It was a matter of convenience. Boehner has a reputation uh, during his period as House Minority Leader of having a perpetual tan, of playing an awful lot of golf, and spending many hours aloft on corporate jets. Altogether, that's not exactly the image of a man likely to stand up on behalf of the people against special corporate interests. In his speech last night, Boehner was careful not to claim some giant new mandate for Republicans, but in a clear bow to the many Tea Party members now in the House, um, he was certainly not conciliatory either. By the way, these are among the top economic items on the agenda of the Tea Party, about which we have talked and will again soon on other, on other aspects of this story. Uh, this is what they have to say on the subject of compromise. No, I'm sorry, these are the issues on which they say they will not compromise. Repeal of the health care bill, and in the meantime, knowing that they can't instantly repeal it and may not be able to repeal it because Obama can veto and, and uh, the Senate can block. But what they plan to do is deny all funding for its implementation. And in fact, there will have to be some, some legislation passed to pay for some of the funding as the, uh, as the time goes by in terms of the evolution and the development uh, for uh, for the health care plan. And uh, this is also going to be true in the case of, uh, of financial reform. Uh, for example, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission had planned to hire many, many more people, uh, including some people that they planned to pay fairly well so that they could do the job properly, so that they could monitor uh, the kinds of things that, uh, that go on on Wall Street and, and one hopes preclude the, uh, the kind of thing that happened in 2008. But if the Tea Party people get their way, there will be no money allocated to the SEC to do any of those monitoring jobs and so make the, uh, the, uh, the regulations having to do with, uh, with the financial institutions uh, less than effective. So even though you can't necessarily repeal them or stop them, you can certainly do things to, uh, to render them, if not totally useless, uh, certainly not terribly effective. Uh, the Tea Party is also uh, planning to pass a federal balanced budget constitutional amendment. It opposes any increase in the government's national debt limit, even if that causes the government to default and shut down. Now, as we, as we, as we know, uh, the debt limit has been going up and there has been kind of a perfunctory vote in the Congress to, to, to keep raising that debt limit so that the government won't default on its many obligations and it won't have to shut down. Uh, the Tea Party, on the other hand, says, so be it. Let it default and let it shut down. Uh, that's something that may come up, actually, uh, even before the Tea Party members are fully installed. Uh, I believe that there has to be a vote during the, uh, the lame duck session, which is going to uh, uh, begin in a week or two and will run until, uh, well, until they get done what they need to get done. And that's before the, uh, the new Congress convenes in January. Uh, also on the Tea Party agenda, slash government spending. Uh, items, for example, in the social safety net, such as Medicare, Medicaid, and unemployment benefits, roll back the Wall Street reforms. And uh, <clears throat> among the positions taken by certain individual members of the Tea Party, uh, Sharon Engel of Nevada, uh, who, uh, who it turns out will not be a senator, but she was trying to be, one of her... Uh, uh, great ideas for saving money was to take the United States out of the United Nations and kick the United Nations out of the United States. Um, and we also know that uh, Paul, uh, Rand Paul, of the new senator from Oklahoma, uh, has publicly stated that he is against aspects of the civil rights bills of 1964 and 65 on the grounds that they are unconstitutional. Now, how influential will the Tea Party really be in the next Congress? 
Well, Tea Party booster and mentor, uh, Senator Jim DeMint of uh, South Carolina, says both House Minority Leader John Boehner and Senator McConnell must understand there's a new sheriff in town. DeMint adds the existing leadership in neither house understands what they are about to face. The ground has shifted out from underneath these people, these people meaning uh, Boehner and McConnell. Now, uh, as I've noted, uh, Barack, Barack Obama still has a presidential veto, and presumably Senate Democrats uh, could, if need be, filibuster, uh, if they can't manage enough votes on their own to pass anything, to head off uh, Republican Tea Party legislation that is particularly egregious. Still, with the Republicans in control of the House, Democrats lose much of their power to set the legislative agenda. And with the control of the House, the GOP uh, may decide to use the subpoena power of some committees to investigate various alleged misuses of power by the Obama administration. Republican Congressman Darrell Issa of California has threatened to do as much. Um, with that situation, I think uh, we would have to be wildly optimistic to expect that the next two years is going to be very productive. In spite of what uh, what the president said and what uh, the Republicans are saying. Uh, and give, given the Tea Party uh, element in this thing, I, 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 I see nothing but gridlock uh, for the next two years. I wish that were not going to be the case. It's possible that they will make some, some progress in the area of, of, of energy. Uh, certainly cap and trade is dead, uh, but there's some possibility that, uh, that there might be some uh, way to get an agreement that would include uh, greater subsidies for nuclear power and other such things uh, as a way of and, and, uh, getting, uh, uh, getting Republican agreement to, uh, to, to something in the area of energy. And it's also believed that there may be some chance to, to improve uh, the education situ situation. And I think that there is a, another renewal of No Child Left Behind that's coming up. And so, People are saying, well, maybe they'll be able to do some things in that area. Uh, really, however, the realistically, is that, you know what today is? Today's the first day of the 2012 presidential campaign. And that is going to be kind of a, a major element hanging over uh, all people in Washington for the next two years. And however much they may deny it, uh, there's no doubt that people are going to be uh, maneuvering to, uh, to get themselves into position uh, for, for the presidential election of 2012. Um, as we know, um, one of the at least likely candidates is Sarah Palin. And uh, one of the biggest questions uh, of this election of yesterday concerns Sarah Palin's, namely, has her star risen or has it fallen because of the, uh, the results? Well, as the self-styled godmother of the Tea Party, Palin endorsed a total of 61 Tea Party candidates in this election cycle, and that includes ones that she uh, endorsed uh, for, uh, uh, prior to the elections in the primaries that, uh, that were held earlier this year. Many of her House choices have been successful. However, her high-profile Senate candidates, Joe Miller in Alaska, Christine O'Donnell in Delaware, and Sharon Angle of Nevada have all lost. Colorado is still up in the air, uh, but the Democrat Michael Bennett is leading in a very close race. Palin also supported Tom Crantado, Tancredo, who ran under the banner of the American Constitutional Party in Colorado in what was a very contentious race, and one that drew in millions of outside dollars. But Democrat John Hickenlooper has won that race. The failure of Palin's anointed one for Alaska, Joe Miller, on its face really looks like an embarrassment for uh, the former governor of Alaska, and this, after all, is still her state. But actually, it speaks much more specifically to the family feud that she has with Lisa Murkowski, who was the Republican uh, senator uh, who uh, was unseated by Palin and uh, Joe Miller.
but who seems uh, on the verge of winning anyway as a write-in candidate. She will caucus with the Republicans, but uh, she will, of course, represent another defeat for, uh, for Ms. Palin. Uh, at the same time, uh, in the final analysis, what happens in Alaska is not going to have too much to do with Palin's position on the national stage, where she continues to have uh, a substantial following. And it's also true that Palin's choices did well enough so that she remains a major force in the Republican Party, uh, that she is a power broker, as described by uh, any number of Republicans, and she is an object of endless speculation about her presidential ambitions in 2012. She's still being a little bit coy on whether or not she will seek the nomination, but it seems that many establishment Republicans notably Karl Rove, who was President George Bush's chief political maven, think that she will run and that this will be a disaster for the Republican Party. Now, in a recent Washington Post ABC News poll, 39% of registered voters say they view Palin favorably, but only 27% believe her to be qualified to be president. Rove has several times questioned Palin's fitness to be president, even if he, as he was trashing some of her endorsees for the Senate, such as Christine O'Donnell in Delaware. Actually, there's more than a little grumbling in the Republican establishment today because they believe that if the GOP had won Nevada, Delaware, and Colorado with less controversial candidates than the Tea Party candidates that eventually ran, they might well have been able to take the Senate as well as the House yesterday. But according to a very respected online inside politics publication called Politico, concerns about Sarah Palin go far beyond that. In a major report on Sunday, Politico reported, quote, top Republicans in Washington and in the national GOP establishment say that the 2010 campaign highlighted an urgent task that they will begin in earnest as soon as the elections are over, stop Sarah Palin. The story is attributed to advisors, to the main presidential contenders, and to veteran Republican operatives who at this point are choosing not to go public, but my guess is that given the election results, this is a story that is only just beginning to build. Now, these are some of the juicier quotes in this report. Many of these establishment figures argue that Palin's nomination would ensure President Barack Obama's re-election as the deficiencies that marked her 2008 debut as vice presidential nominee, an intensely polarizing political style and often halting and superficial answers when pressed on policy have shown little signs of abating in the past two years. There is a determined, focused establishment effort to find a candidate we can coalesce around who can beat Sarah Palin, said one prominent and longtime Washington Republican. We believe she could get the nomination, but Barack Obama would crush her. Among those Republicans likely to seek the 2012 nomination are former governors Mitt Romney of Massachusetts, Tom Pawlenty of, Wisconsin, of Minnesota, Senator John Thune of South Dakota, and Haley Barber, who's currently the governor of Mississippi and former head of the National, uh, Republican National Committee, are also very likely candidates. These people and their supporters and operatives like Rove and Ed Gillespie, uh, who were part of uh, the team that created and ran some of these big anonymous donor funds, which poured tens of millions of dollars into the latest midterm campaign, may or may not be able to stop Palin, but it's certainly interesting to know that such a move is afoot. For her part, Palin publicly dismissed them as not having the courage to put their names to such a movement, but my guess is she's gonna be watching this very carefully and uh, knowing her, maybe if she's not gonna have a coronation as presidential candidate, uh, she may decide not to join the fight. So stay tuned on that one. I don't think any discussion of what the outcome of a given election is complete without a look at the role of the news media and what role they may have played in the outcome. As you might imagine, uh, having spent about a half a century in the news business and covered several national election campaigns when I was with ABC News. I, I'm more than just a casual observer on this subject. When I decided to take early retirement from ABC News about 15 years ago, I swore I would never fall victim to the dreaded disease 
that has a way of afflicting men of my age, affectionately known as old fartitis. <laughs> in short, that's the belief that everything was better in the good old days, and nowadays everything stinks. I must confess that I have contracted at least a mild case of this illness. Now, president Harry Truman said that one of the most important powers of the presidency is the power to persuade. The man he replaced, FDR, was of course one of the great persuaders with his fireside chats, among other things. Even until about 30 years ago, an American president could tell the three networks that he was having a news conference or had something important to say, and he could count on getting the attention of about 90% of the American people. That, of course, is absolutely no longer true, which means that the presidential persuading business has gotten a lot harder. First, it was the challenge of cable television, which gave people many more options to watch instead of the president. They could be watching uh, I, Lo I Love Lucy reruns or their favorite sports programs. And then came 24-7 all-news cable channels, each with its own ideological bent. And at the same time, the internet was developing as an, international, as an information source. Then YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. While a president could once have a virtual captive audience to address, there are now so many channels, so many platforms, that sometimes it may seem that it would almost be easier for him to go door to door. At the same time, audiences are a lot tougher than they used to be. Millions of voters have developed very firmly held views often that they picked up from less than totally reliable sources. It's been said that the internet is a great liberator, that people can now find out for themselves what is true, and they don't have to believe the politicians or the news media. Now, in theory, that may be true, but I have found that for all the benefits of the internet, there are some serious downsides. Much of what is available comes in the form of blogs, in which people are free to express their opinions. Now, there's nothing wrong with people expressing their opinions, but opinions aren't facts. And I find that many devotees of the internet have a very difficult time distinguishing between the two. And in the phrase coined by Senator Pat Moynihan many years ago, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. That used to be so, but it seems to be no longer in terms of the way in which the news is reported. The amount of misinformation on the internet in the, f uh, in the form of opinions is in fact staggering. Uh, the American people, uh, the American people never had access to more information than they have today from more different sources. But there are definite signs that the American people remain frighteningly ill-informed. At the same time, the proliferation of platforms and fragmentation of the mainstream news media has dramatically reduced the media's role as an institution that people uh, used to turn to in time of crisis and actually believed. In the time of men like Cronkite and Brinkley and Jennings and Brokaw, when 50 or 60 million Americans sat down each night to dinner to watch the evening news, network television had its greatest influence, partly because it rejected extremes it supported moderation, and its symbols had, were men of unquestioned journalistic excellence and integrity. In holding to centrist policies, the anchors and their colleagues contributed, I think, in substantial measure to peace and stability in both foreign and domestic affairs. And if you look at the period of uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and of the Kennedy assassination and from uh, the, the space race and, and other such things, uh, in each of these, uh, the networks played a very positive and a very positive role, and certainly in the uh, in the civil rights battles of the 1960s. Uh, but that was then, and this is now. And today, the mainstream media have become merely part of one more failed institution, which is not trusted by the American people, unless it offers opinions that are in sync with the people who read and watch that particular channel or paper. Thus, I think it can be argued that extremists of any persuasion are given far more exposure and are not being called out by knowledgeable reporters when they make baseless claims and do great harm to the truth. For most of my life, people in this country believe that democracy 
could not survive unless there was a healthy, objective news media that sought to make both government and the private sector accountable for their actions. I fear that is no longer the case. And I think I'm going to leave it there, and I am more than happy to, uh, to begin to take some questions uh, from you, and I'll do the best I can to, uh, to answer them. Uh, I, 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 I shouldn't say I hope factually. I'll do the best I can to answer them factually. And uh, so let us begin. Yes, sir. I mentioned a bunch of fairly undistinguished Republicans as possible opponents of Sarah Palin. Yes. What happened to Newt Gingrich? <laughs> I guess I could have put him up there. Uh, what I have been hearing is that he has become so discredited that there is no chance. But. You know, uh, he, he could easily be one. I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not handicapping the Republicans at all. I, I, I think it's a, a, you make a good point. Uh, I, I have actually had just been visiting Washington and New York, in which I was talking to a lot of people, and, and uh, from those sources, I was, I was getting very, very bad vibes about him, but, uh, but that, that could change. Right. Yes, sir. I, I've been here for 15 years, but... Uh, the, You're a Vermonter by choice. Like by choice, yes. yes. I actually started coming up to Vermont uh, in the mid-1970s uh, when a friend of mine had a vacation place. Uh, he was a Montrealer, but he had a vacation place near Jay Peak. So I, I came up in the uh, Christmas of 1975, I believe. So it was my first connection. And I maintained a connection through him for quite a few years. And then my wife and I bought a vacation home here in the late uh, mid-80s. Mid and uh, then I, when I decided to retire from ABC News, I spent a year at Harvard as a fellow at the Kennedy School, and then I came up here and uh, unfortunately I had to sell my place up in JP because I couldn't afford to keep that and buy a house here too. <laughs> anyway, so I, I've been here for, for 15 years s steadily and uh, over a period of uh, 25, 35 years. Yeah. That wasn't my question. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to establish you know, some kind of Vermont bona fides, that's all. Yes. So I had a solution to this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it may be as ridiculous as it sounds, so much of this quagmire is caused, as you said before, starting today, the next two years are going to be a waste. And I think our founding fathers are just on rotisseries in their graves because they, this was not what they intended. Let's eliminate re-election. No, no, I'm listening. I'm listening. Let's give everyone a single six-year term, stagger them so it's not everybody coming up at once. Say, get in there, do your job, make a difference over six years rather than doing your job for a year and a half or 24 months like you're doing now and then running for re-election and having 
all of your decisions made not by what's right or what's wrong or what's good for everybody or what um, makes sound fiscal sense, but what's going to get you reelected. And at the end of six years, go home and let somebody else take over. It seems to me that would eliminate lobbyists, political action committees, special interest groups, corporate influence, and all the other things that stymie the new progress that we had to get out of this mess. Just curious as to your opinion. Okay. I know it'll never happen. It, it is naive and it won't happen. Well, I don't say it's naive. I, 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 I actually heard that subject being discussed uh, in several quarters today uh, on the radio or on television. Or, well, I've been listening since about six this morning and some of it. I can't remember. I can't remember. I, sh I can't remember my sources. But I do know this, that, that term limits have frequently been proposed and occasionally been tried. Uh, and the, the track record is not particularly good. Uh, for one thing, um, six years does seem like a long time, but um, it's in, in, especially in, in very complex situations, it really doesn't give you a lot of time to start to develop an institutional memory. Uh, and institutional memories are very useful. Uh, I, I know that from my own field and uh, in, in many other fields, the people who've been around say, yeah, okay, I saw that, and we, you know, we tried that five years ago. It doesn't work. Uh, the, the problem is, more often than not, it's the, it's the continuous reinventing of the wheel that's created by the situation, that, that people just don't have enough experience to be able to see the pitfalls of, of many things. And the, the other element that, that, that people want, and they say, you know, they say they don't want it, but then, they really do want it, and that is they want their congressmen or their senators uh, to be looking out for their interests. And honestly, if, they're, if, if, if you don't have a seniority system, uh, you don't get a lot of stuff done in terms of being able to get to bring home the bacon, to be able to get those special million dollar, three million dollar, five million dollar projects that. In a, in a small state like this can make a huge difference. I mean, Pat Leahy is constantly doing this sort of stuff. It's all perfectly legal and it's pretty good for the state. But if you eliminated all of that, uh, you would be really negatively affecting the relationship between, the, between those who are serving. And because you know, if, they're, if you're not bringing home the bacon, what is it are you doing? I mean, you're, maybe you're off worrying about the price of tea in China and other things like that. But people do want a local connection and they expect to get some return. And when you look at the numbers, uh, there are almost no states that, that uh, uh, actually Vermont is sort of right near the bottom in terms of how much money they get back from the federal government as opposed to how much they give the federal government in taxes. But some of the states, which are the most likely ones to complain about the federal government, I think of Mississippi, for example, or Louisiana, they're up around two, 250 for every dollar that they pay. And they want this money. They need this money. I mean, Alaska, these people who are constantly claiming how, you know, how independent-minded they are. If they weren't on the federal dole, they'd all, you know, this Alaska would sink back into Russia with Sarah with him. So <laughs> I, 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 I understand what you're trying to say, and, and there may be some aspect of that there, uh, but I, uh, I don't think it'll work. But anyway, I could, I could be wrong. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. You stated a lot of these things that weren't factual, but there seemed to be such a strong propaganda element against him that he, he was like, he wasn't mean enough. I mean, Hillary was a hell of a lot mean <laughs> Well, enough. that's, 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 that's a, a very good point. point. That, 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 you, you know, know because, because I mean, I've tried to offer some, some, some of the, you know, the, the, the institutional reasons and, and so on as to, but uh, you pose a very good question. And I, I think part of the problem, for example, I, because I am, 
uh, in semi-retirement, I write a column uh, and, I, and I do uh, radio work and I do some speeches and so on. But I'm at home and I, I watch, uh, <laughs> until my brain sometimes is fried, I watch uh, cable television and, and, uh, and I, listen to, uh, I listen to quite a bit of radio. Um, Obama has actually done all those things in, in various forums, in various places in the country. He has, he has challenged the, you know, the Republicans. He has made the point, you know, no one seems to know that we, that, you know, that we cut taxes for the middle class. And, and, but it really goes, to some extent, goes to, to the point that I was making earlier, where it's a lot harder to be a presidential persuader than it used to be, because just to, you can't just command a national audience. You know, when, when he wants to do a, uh, well, I, 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 I can't speak to every news conference, but I know for sure that there was one important news conference he was doing in prime time, and Fox News just said, to hell with it, we're not covering it. And so with Fox News, the people who watch Fox News are the people who ought to listen to the president. At least he would want to communicate with them because they're the ones who are most likely to be opposed to what he's doing. But they're, I mean, Fox News just said, we're not carrying that. And I know for sure there was one, and I believe more than one news conference that they did not cover. And the networks themselves, uh, especially if it's in prime time, are very leery about giving him time. Uh, during the daytime, you know, they're, they're cutting into soaps maybe, and sometimes they will do that, and sometimes they won't. Uh, so even, even with the, the, the three major networks, so, so very often he's, you know, he's yelling away or, 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 or trying to make his point to the relatively small audiences uh, that are on, available on, on cable television. I mean, if you, if you get uh, MSNBC during the day, I mean, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I'm hazarding a guess here, but it's probably, certainly no more than half a million people would be watching and probably fewer than that. So it's very hard and, and also the, the message that he's trying to, to give, for example, you know, it could have been a lot worse. You know, we saved three million jobs. Yeah, but we lost eight million. So we, you know, with a net five loss and we've still got a 10% unemployment. Those kinds of arguments are, are, are not so effective. When they talk about death panels, I mean, he many times challenged that. But not one single member of the Republican Party leadership was willing to get up and say, um, that's nonsense, there's nothing like, um, Grassley could have done it. He, you know, he worked for several months with uh, what the senator from Montana. And, and, and anyway, it, it, you know, he, uh, he actually talked about death panels in a public meeting that summer, the summer of 2009. So the other thing that, that I, I didn't mention here anywhere, and I was, I was going to mention it and I wanted to, but I thought I'd sort of run out of time. One thing the Republicans did with, I think, with devastating effectiveness was to diminish this president and also even to delegitimize him by running these cockamamie campaigns about whether or not he was born in this country. Um, Haley Barber, who, <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, the governor of, uh, of Mississippi at the moment and a likely, almost certainly, presidential candidate. He said, and was quoted wild, uh, widely, that Obama was the least known president this country has ever had. So what they, you know, they, they didn't want to jump on him for being black, but they went at him in other ways that that they wouldn't have done to a white guy, or a white woman for that matter. But he was vulnerable to that kind of thing, the whisper campaign that he was a Muslim. Uh, and and uh, that did end up diminishing him, and to some extent delegitimized him, and ultimately weakened his voice when there was a dispute. Uh, I, don't think we can, uh, I don't think we can dismiss that. Uh, I, I have with me here, and I'm not, going, I'm not going to read it all, but, I, but it was very interesting. I got this, uh, got this yesterday, I guess, or the day before yesterday. Uh, it's an email that was, that was making the rounds around the country. And essentially, 
it makes, oh, 25 or 30 points that, that all begin with, you didn't get mad when, um, well, for example, uh, when Bush embraced trade and outsourcing policies and shipped six million American jobs out of the country. Uh, you didn't get mad when you saw the horrible conditions at Walter Reed, or when New Orleans was allowed to drown, or when tax breaks were given to the rich uh, that, that amounted to the amount of money that did. You didn't get mad with the worst years, of eight years of job creation. You didn't get mad when 2,000 citizens uh, uh, were, were affected uh, very, very negatively because they didn't have health insurance. And it, it, this says 2,000 citizens actually died because of it. I, I, I can't speak to that. You didn't get mad when the lack of oversight and regulations from the Bush administration caused U.S. citizens to lose $12 trillion in investments, retirement, and home values. I did get mad about that, but, but most people didn't. But the, the last sentence is, you finally got mad when a black man was elected president and decided that people in America deserve the right to see a doctor if they were sick. So all of this talk about anger, it, it, that bothers me. I mean, the, most of the people who are supposedly so damned angry uh, are employed. They're not on food stamps. They're paying lower taxes than they've ever paid. Uh, when they talk about free and, and, and the worrying about the, about, about the Second Amendment rights, there's never been greater Second Amendment rights in the country, as we can see from the number of people who are constantly being shot around the country. Uh, I mean, you can go into a bar in Texas and, and half the states, uh, you know, with your, with your gun on your, on your belly. So that's, a, that's a, a, a false, a very false reason to be angry, and yet people are angry. You know, he's threatening. The more guns were sold the day after Obama was elected than had been sold for the, you know, the preceding however many months or years because people were afraid he was, go he was going to take their guns away. He, you know, he, th hasn't, he made even the tiniest move in that direction. But it's that kind of drumbeat and that kind of negative campaign that, as I say, has diminished. And to some extent, in the eyes of many people, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but there was a poll taken regarding the percentage of Republicans who believed that Obama was not an American citizen and was not born in America. It was more than 50%. So what are you going to do? Hmm? Good life, all conviction. It's a great, great intensity. It's arguing gyro, spinning and spinning. Yeah. Are there any ladies that ask me questions? All these guys have been talking. Do I have a, 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 You, sir, in the back, I'll get to you in a moment. But here, I, I wasn't looking in your direction. It's because this is my bad eye. Anyway, so, yes. Well, you talk about Rush Limbaugh and, and Fox News and the drumbeat of the Republicans. Is there anyone claimed to be? Well, I tell you, um, MSNBC, with Ed Schultz and Rachel Maddow particularly, have, have tried to do that. But again, they're, they're, they're dealing with a, with a relatively minuscule audience. Limbaugh has 20 million people listening to him every day for three hours. Uh, there's, you know, if, if you were driving across the country, you can listen to li and, and, and without a satellite radio. You can kind of listen to them. I think there are two, two or three stations in the Vermont area where you can pick up Limbaugh. Uh, he has a huge, huge audience. Uh, so there, I think there are people who have a fairly loud, uh, Schultz is certainly uh, loud and, and uh, assertive, and, and so is Rachel in her own way. I think she's actually quite good. I don't like uh, uh, some of the other people on, uh, on MSNBC, but... Uh, but the whole network wouldn't, as, even on a really good night, they might have maybe a million people listening and are watching. And uh, um, that's, that's just not a fair fight with, uh, with the amount of exposure that somebody like Limbaugh has. And then O'Reilly's got his own radio show and, does, and get, has an hour or two. Uh, and then you've got all these people who do have their own shows and Fox. And Fox is by far two and a half times, at least, uh, the ratings of, uh, of MSNBC or CNN. Uh, and so it's not just the, the point of having a liberal voice, it's having a place 
that they will get the same exposure as the, uh, as the conservative voices. And so far, no one's been successful at doing that. Yes, sir. All right, the times. Yes, yes. The media has been pushing on all of us for months and months and months, and it gets exhausting even by the attempt of sort of neutral media. And it becomes it becomes a, a fight for to breathe another possibility into the campaign against that kind of onslaught in communication. Mm -hmm. and you've been kind of answering some of that a little bit. Yeah, and you know, there, there is... Uh, there is a history in, in recent years of the, of the so-called liberal media, uh, with the New York Times sort of right up front and center, of being very, um, what, what word could I, dismissive almost of, of uh, Democratic candidates for president. Uh, they did by far one of the greatest hatchet jobs ever on poor old Al Gore. And, you know, it has, been, it has been looked at and analyzed and, and, and had an enormous impact. Although Gore still won the election, by the way, but um, he, um, the, the Times was, was very tough on him. I mean, but the color of the clothes that he wore and claiming that he and his wife had been the, the, uh, the models for the characters in uh, Love Story and other, and each time uh, it was, there was something that would come up that would, Oh yes, and he claimed to have invented the internet. Well, it finally was you know, analyzed by a number of people and, and it turned out that virtually none of that was true. But each one was cited as a, as a gore untruth. Now, if we started to do the size of the nose of some of the Republicans in the last two years, I mean, there wouldn't be room in this room for one nose. But these are the, these are the lies that Al Gore was feeding us. It turned out that he never said that he and his wife had been models, that it had been said by the, it was quote, it, the author of the book, Siegel, Eric Siegel, was it, who wrote Love Story? He was quoted in the Tennessean as having said that Gore was the model. And Gore quoted him, the author, in the Tennessean. Later, Siegel wrote a letter to the Tennessee and said, I didn't say that. And so Gore was accused of lying because he had quoted the Tennessee and then later Eric Siegel had retracted what they had said about him. So that kind of stuff. And, and, and that's, that, can have a, that can have a very negative effect too. Because if, if, if the liberals aren't supporting you and the conservatives are pummeling you, and the independents are running like hell in the opposite direction. You know, you've got no place to go. How does the media control that? I mean, well, it, seeing as there is, there is no form of media control, you'd like to think that, the, as, you know, in their, in their own uh, quiet moments, they could look and reflect upon what it is they're doing and, and see if they can prevent. You know, I, I remember when I was covering pre presidential campaigns, which was a long time ago, the last real campaign I covered was I, I covered Scoop Jackson in 1976. I did some other stuff along the way, but the, that w I, I was with him from sort of day one to the day he pulled out. Uh, but we used to talk about the fact that we were wasting too much time on the horse race, you know, who's ahead, who's not, and all that, and that we should be focusing more on, on, on the issues and where this particular candidate fits into the scheme of things and what, what he's likely to do, not, you know, not whether he tripped over his tie on the way to breakfast or something, you know, but, I mean, that, that went back even, even uh, when I was there. But now, I mean, did anybody hear anything about issues in this campaign? I didn't hear. I mean, virtually none. It was all about the horse race. That's it. End of story. Well, 
And people also get fed up with that, and they just tune out. So whatever's kind of being said, it doesn't have an impact. So even if they, if they hear things that maybe they ought to hear, they just tune out and say a pox on all your houses and you're all lying thieves. So anyway, on that happy note, do we have a couple more questions? Yes, Frankie. So I don't understand that part. But then, but then the other thing that maybe nobody in the room can explain to me is um, on, the, on the right, and especially the, the extreme right on those sides, it's all about we are the greatest country in the world and only America and, uh, and um, we're, we're going to clean up the Iranians and we're going to you know, mold all these people into the way that we want to be. And then at the same time, it's they want to have smaller government. Hello? You're the last standing superpower. How do you have a smaller government and still be, we're number one, and, and we're going we're to support the Israelis to the very end, we're going to crush Ahmadinejad. It's like, where? And because, because this administration couldn't turn around years of, as you said, two wars and everything else, uh, ouch. I mean, mm. what, how does that happen? How does that happen? Unless it was like education, where everybody wants rigor, and so it's their kid that is, is having to work to a rigorous uh. standard. I don't know. I, that's the piece that I do, I cannot comprehend. And the other piece I can't comprehend is, do they just not notice that the rest of the world is going, one of these guys are real. <laughs> they don't care. Because this is the greatest country in the world. <laughs> the USA thing, I think I'm trying to remember, I heard it, and I'm trying to remember, I, was it by any chance when John Boehner was crying last night? Uh, they were trying to cheer him up? Um, I, I, I watched him make that speech about 10 times, but last night when he was on, he was on national television, on all the networks, he managed to really tell us how bad it was when he was working as a, as a, his, his father owned a bar and he was one of 11 kids and he used to have to clean up the slop and other such things in the bar and, but, and then he began to cry when he, when he, and, and, and he said, and I was just chasing the American dream. And that's when they said, USA, USA. <laughs> Uh, but the question of American exceptionalism, by the way, that is the third rail of American politics. You cannot, if you are going to be a successful candidate for any national office, you cannot dispute that. It, it, you do so at extreme peril to your life, your political life. In fact, you're dead if you do that. And uh, so the successful ones who are in office don't, which perpetuates the myth. I mean, this is a very wonderful country. With, with things which Americans should well be proud of. But I don't know whether some of you were listening or not, but there was an interview yesterday on, on Vermont Public Radio. I've forgotten the name of the author, but he has written a book in which he talks about uh, the period of the history of this country from roughly from the 1800s to the 1850s. I'm sorry, what? Uh, well, anyway, it was, anyway, it was about you know, some of the shenanigans that were taking place at that time. And these are things about which Americans ought not to be proud. And I think part of it was, uh, was the, uh, the Andrew Jackson period and, and the, you know, the massacre of the, of the Indians and so on. But he, this man says that this is not in any American history books. That it's not. And of course, they certainly aren't in any Texas history books because as we know, they have their own history book, which most of the rest of the country get because they order all the books. And I, I think that's too bad. I think that, that 
people are ultimately better off if they have a, a true understanding of what their country is, recognize some of its blemishes, try to uh, correct them when possible, and uh, carry on. Uh, Americans have every right to be very proud of this country, and it is very unusual. To, but to say that there's no other country in the universe as good as this one, well, I mean, Canadians don't think that. And, uh, Well, during the, during the Empire days, I mean, Winston Churchill felt that way, yes. At least the Empire was an empire. It wasn't, I mean, Frankie, I think this is a subject about which you should tread softly. Do you have one, one more question, maybe? Sure. How about you, sir? Uh, well, one observation and a question. Uh, we, we took quite a bit of talk about Obama communicating more. Personally, I don't think he's a very good communicator when unscripted. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. And let me answer that this way. I, 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 I'm a big fan of Howard Dean. And I, and I, uh, I was writing a column, uh, actually I was writing for the, before I was fired with the Burlington Free Press, uh, about that campaign. You, you people don't know that I was fired by the Burlington Free Press. That's my badge of honor, by the way. Uh, I was fired because I wrote a column about uh, fundamentalism. Uh, Islamic fundamentalism, Israeli fundamentalism, and American fundamentalism. And the uh, publisher of the paper evidently took strong exception to it, and I was can't. But anyway, that's, that's, I digress very much there. Uh, but a, a number of columns, that it, well, I guess it's related to the extent that, that uh, the excuse that was given is that I, 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 my columns weren't local enough. They were about things that, you know, that they didn't want me to write about. Well, I actually had written eight columns for the Burlington Free Press. I think six of them were about Howard Dean. So it wasn't like I had gone off into Mars or, uh, or Afghanistan. Uh, now, Howard Dean. His, his strategy looked very successful at the end of 2008 because they brought in, it was an all-state strategy, and they spent money in every state, and they brought in New, uh, new Democratic congressmen, particularly, uh, from states that had virtually never elected a, a Democrat. And all of that looked very good for a while. But I was looking at some of the numbers today. Uh, a number of those people are what are called the blue dog Dem Democrats, which uh, the expression comes from uh, a time that, uh, that you, but the only thing, <laughs> I'm screwing it up, that, that you, that you uh, would rather vote for a blue dog than a Democrat or, or a Republican or something. I don't know, I've, I've lost it completely. There, but there was a reason for the expression blue dog, and it related to dyed-in-the-wool uh, Democrats regardless of whatever. But the blue dog Democrats are very conservative. Uh, the numbers I saw were that half of those people were wiped out in this. Half of the ones that, that were elected last year for the first time, and they were, they were among the blue dogs, have been, have been uh, defeated. And that many of those people who had actually voted against Obama's health care plan and the stimulus package, but they just were wiped out because they were Democrats. So the question becomes, if they're that vulnerable on the one hand, but they have a major influence on policy during the time that they're around, and they did, is that necessarily a good thing? I, I ask that question without, uh, sort of rhetorically, because I'm not quite sure. Maybe it could be argued that it was a good thing. So to the extent that that experiment seemed to be successful, but now seems to be a failure, maybe Dean doesn't look so good. 
I, I haven't seen a word about that, by the way. I don't think anybody's gotten to that subject yet. Uh, I, thought I thought he was good at, at, with the DNC, I, and, and you know, his problem simply was that he and, uh, and uh, the White House simply didn't see eye to eye on how this uh, was going to happen, and uh, so he was never offered a decent job uh, at, by the Obama people, and I thought that was too bad because I think, you know, the dean has an awful lot to offer, and it's really a pity that he didn't. But having said that, I don't know whether, in retrospect, whether it was maybe such a good idea or not, because it's almost like during the, the bad old days of segregation, one of the serious problems was the Southern Democrat. And people such as Franklin Delano Roosevelt and other great liberals uh, were forced very often to do some pretty reprehensible things because they had this substantial number of, of uh, Democratic senators from the South who, uh, you know, who simply wouldn't abide by anything that, uh, that smelled of any kind of, of integration. I mean, they were total segregationists and they, and they thrived and prospered for a very long time. And in a sense, when Lyndon Johnson bit the bullet and, and did the two civil rights campaign, uh, civil rights laws, uh, then all the, <laughs> all the Southern Democrats resigned and became Republicans. And I personally at that time felt good riddance. You know, go ahead, be Republicans, because you were just, and there, there were some really horrible stories. One of the worst ones has to do with, uh, at a time when particularly farmers were, were being crushed both by the, the uh, the depression, the economic depression, and the drought in the 1930s. And so the Department of Agriculture uh, came up with a scheme that, that of uh, agricultural subsidies to, particular, to tenant farmers who were among the very hardest hit. And um, the plan was going along until they the uh, Senate Southern Democrat, who was head of the Agriculture Committee, got wind of it. And he called in a guy from the Department of Agriculture and he said that there was no way he was going to allow the government to give money to his niggers. And uh, so ultimately, they gave him and, and, and others, and he, he was, you know, he was uh, uh, virtually a slaveholder, although they weren't slaves exactly, but they were people who were working on, uh, on cotton farms and tobacco farms. And so the, the money was given to the farmer or the owner, but most of it never got passed on to the tenant farmer. And so they starved by the thousands, and um, that was the end of it. So that was one of the poisonous aspects of having, even for somebody as powerful as Roosevelt, of having these Southern Democrats in the, in the culture. So my feeling is that, uh, I'm not suggesting any of the blue dogs, recent blue dogs or anything of that ilk, but, but they didn't really ideologically fit in any way. And if they weren't going to be an asset, and ultimately if they, you know, they've only lasted two years, then they're not much of an asset. That's an awfully long answer to that question. I hope it's somewhat satisfactory. But. I'm digressing a lot on stuff. And, and will you be able to stay afterwards and take uh, some more questions? Afterwards? After we, we conclude tonight. Uh, sure, if I can sit down. Uh, I, I, I hate to keep complaining about health, but I, I just had a knee replacement a few weeks ago, and, I, and I've been standing a very long time, and I need to sit down. Well, Mr. Dunsmore, I want to thank you very much. Okay, thank you.